topic of uh, the, the discussion today is digital utopia, digital dystopia. And what I'd like to look at is some of the very rapidly changing areas of technology and how these are changing our society, our business, and the very nature of what it means to be human. And I always find it interesting that when I talk to you know, students at a university, it occurs to me that you know the subject much, much better than I do because you are not only what's known as a digital native, but you're probably the generation which is the most fully immersed in technology and the least afraid of it. And um, I, I just find this consistently interesting because the way I grew up uh, is very, very different from the way you grew up. I mean, when I grew up in the summers, for example, my parents would uh, schlep me and my brother to the Choryo. Uh, you know, we didn't have TV, we didn't have uh, telephones. Literally, we had no phones. We had, we, we had nothing really to do um, except go out and play basketball or hide and seek or, or stuff with the other kids um, in the village. And uh, this is something that Bano might be familiar with. You know, it's something that the older generation, you know, probably went through. But the concept of not being connected for someone like my daughter or my son is fundamentally foreign. You guys have grown up connected to the internet and connected to your friends, connected to literally a whole world of you know digital content, digital experience and things to do. And so for you, you're probably in a way always busy. You're always switched on, you always have something to do. There's always something to occupy your time. And I remember for us in the summers, the weirdest thing was time, because we would wake up, have breakfast, and then, you know, there was like this huge stretch of time up until lunch. And then we knew after lunch, it was everyone fell asleep, right? And you, you had to be quiet even if you didn't sleep. You would then wake up at five, there'd be this other stretch of time until dinner time. There'd be a dinner time, then, you know, you have to find a way to occupy yourself up until you go to bed. Well, today, how do we occupy ourselves? You know, you, you just open your mobile and you start scrolling or you start chatting or whatever. But back then, time had value. Um, back then, a vacation in the summer was three full months. And those three full months were like a lifetime uh, in themselves. Today, I think you all know that summer vacation starts and kind of before you know it, summer vacation is over, basically. So we're just in this environment which is changing incredibly rapidly where for, for you, who's kind of at the center of technological change, it's all very natural, it's all very clear. But for the older generations, for the investors, for people who have to you know, make decisions, for example, on how to set up a teaching curriculum or stuff like that, it's very, very different. Um, let me give you a really simple example. The classic teaching day at school, I, I don't know about Cyprus, but in the United States, it's like nine in the morning until roughly three or 3.30 in the afternoon. And that's divided into 45 minute periods, basically. And between each period, you're supposed to go from one class to the other. So they give you roughly a 10 to 15 minute time. Now, why do you suppose that the day is structured from 9 to 3.30 or 9 to 3? Well, it's pretty obvious. It's so your parents can go to work. So school is something like a warehouse, right? It's something where, you know, we drive in the morning, we drop the kids off in school because we need to get to work. And then what happens from 3.30 to 6? Well, hopefully there'll be some extracurricular activities so that, you know, the kids can fill up their, their day a little bit more. And then at 6 o'clock, school ends and kids come back to school in time for dinner, maybe do a bit of homework, go to sleep, wake up, and repeat that process the next day. Now, let's take even the, the you know, the idea of a 45-minute class session. Today, who can concentrate for 45 minutes? I don't think anyone can. And sorry, I know I'm undermining your teaching profession no. right now. <laughs> but I mean, today, you're hard pressed to concentrate for five to 10 minutes on a single subject without a digital stimuli, without you know something coming from the digital environment, which is going to enable your really fast moving brain you know, to, to absorb new knowledge, to, 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 you know, to get new information, to reject it if you don't like it, and so on and so forth. And for you guys, your brains are working at like the speed of light. Your, you know, social media, the internet, it's all trained you to absorb information very, very, very quickly. And yet the traditional way of absorbing information is what? You know, here's, here's an article in Harvard Business Review, please read the article, you know, come up with a, an essay or something like that in reaction to it. So there's this dramatic, you know, there's this dramatic, um, 
I don't want to say chasm, but there's a dramatic divide between how society has traditionally been set up and how our society is evolving with the hope of the future, which is you guys, um, and, and how we're going to try to bridge this gap. And you see it pretty much everywhere, right? You see it in the voting system. I mean, why should we go stand in line and vote if we could vote online? Um, why should we do so many things offline with the current gov you know, with, with like government services that we could easily do online? Well, I mean, there are reasons for that. Part of it is inertia, part of it is need to create jobs and so on and so forth. Part of it is need to protect jobs. But you can clearly understand that we're in this transition point now where the traditional way of doing things is more and more apparent that it doesn't work, but we haven't really switched over to the new way of doing things, and we're not entirely sure how that new way of doing things is going to wind up. And that's the that's, that's subject of my talk today. And I'm approaching this from the viewpoint not just of a, say, a social scientist or an observer. I'm a consultant, so I'm called upon to solve a lot of these issues that we're trying to address. And I'm also approaching this from the viewpoint of an investor because if we can identify areas where change can be delivered, uh, then we can hopefully accelerate the rate of change in a sustainable way for both you know, the older generations and the younger generations, the public sector and the private sector, and you know, everyone involved uh, in the deal. So we have a fundamental thesis, which I realize probably sounds a bit ridiculous, but this thesis is that as we move forward, we all prefer to live online. And what do I mean by the word live? Of course, we're not living online. We're living in the physical universe. You know, we haven't yet gotten into the matrix or whatever. But pretty much everything we do today is online, right? Our, I mean, my work started at around 6 o'clock this morning when I turned on my laptop and started work. And I worked continually on the laptop until around 3 o'clock when I had to get in, the, get in the car and come here, basically. And all of that work is online. If I did not have the World Wide Web, I literally would not be able to work um, you know, according to the standards that are, that are expected. If you take most sectors today, you take for example the tourism sector, which is roughly 20% of Cyprus's GDP. Tourism is above all a physical activity, right? You get on a plane, you fly to Cyprus, you go to your hotel, you spend a week in the hotel, you go to the beach. So it's all in a physical environment, but tourism is determined entirely online. Right? Tourists will research their destination and make decisions online before booking. Tourists will book online. Tourists will book not just a hotel, but they will book their excursions. They will book, you know, um, add-ons. Uh, pretty much everything takes place online. So even though we've got this physical dimension to the work we're doing, there's this tremendous digital overlay which is going faster and faster and becoming more and more complete uh, in everything we do. And when we, when, you know, when, when you start looking at how you know, we, we actually work, we kind of see this happening more and more often. So 20 years ago, banking, media, tourism, they migrated online, right? Huge sectors of the economy are now primarily driven by online transactions. That makes everything that is next to it um, outmoded as long as it doesn't move online as well. So let's take the banking sector, right? You're all used to banking online. When is the last time anyone's gone to a bank and stood in line? Anyone remember? When I made the cut. Yes, yeah. Um, it's, it's now the exception, right? The, the, the physical interactions that you have are now the exception. The primary transactions you have are all digital. Let's take insurance. Insurance has still not migrated online for various reasons, um, but it's only a question of time before it will. Uh, and and, and some, some people have, and some investors already have. The other point is that the way we see data and interact with data is changing rapidly. Um, we all have our small screens, we have our phones, we have our laptops, and so on and so forth. But the, you know, the really amazing experience starts when you get up to 4K or 8K. Um, I've actually seen 12K um, monitors that are coming out on an experimental basis the quality of what you see on that screen is better than real life, right? You don't want to go out into the world anymore. You want to stay in front of the screen because the quality of the colors and the interactive experience is simply so much better. 
On top of that, we're going to start to heavily add augmented and virtual reality. Um, this is already quite far advanced for, you know, for some specialized areas, including gaming. I think once the uh, Apple um, headset comes out, even though it's tremendously expensive, I think it's going to drag a lot of other competitors with it. We already see that. We see the, you know, the third Oculus uh, Rift, the, the Quest 3 has just come out um, in response to that. And again, once you get used to this environment, it becomes very, very difficult to be outside that environment. Because in this digital environment, you are faster, you are stronger, you're more accurate, you could do more things quickly enough, and you can control what you see, and you can even control the, you know, the, the biological reactions that you have um, as, you know, in terms of things like serotonin and things like that. Gamification has already taken place. Uh, that was one of the early discoveries of social media. That, you know, why is there a likes bar on Facebook? There's a likes bar because that affects how you feel. The more likes you get, the better you feel. And then the opposite is also true. The fewer likes you get, typically the worse you tend to feel. So we're trying to gamify everything. You've probably seen it uh, much more than I have. Um, my son was one of the top gamers in, I forget what the... I, I, I totally don't know what the what the what the game was called. Fortnite. No, it was it was like Call of Duty, but it was one of the previous. Okay, that's my comment. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, he became so fast that the game would actually throttle him. That it would cut down his speed because it, they thought he was cheating. So my son developed these phenomenal reactions and this phenomenal ability to to you know to shoot people in a virtual environment. Um, but if you ask him then to learn Greek or to learn French, right, to learn a complex language, he can't do it. Um, it's, it's, it's something which is just tremendously difficult because the brain has to work in different ways, right? It, it, if you're trying to learn a complex grammar, you've got to go over it time and time again, you have to repeat it and so on and so forth. If you're a gamer and you're reacting on, on milliseconds of time, um, and you know, you're developing your hand-eye coordination and you're using all of the tricks and the shortcuts that you have, you're in a fundamentally different place, right? I mean, so we, we talk about gaming and we talk about ga gamification, and this has been a huge craze now for years, and I can't tell you the number of startups I've seen and evaluated that are trying to gamify everything from cooking breakfast to teaching history. Um, but this is a trend, and it's a trend which uses our biochemical reactions to try to achieve either an educational input or, or something else. And so what the opposite then becomes also true. The, the opposite is that real world reactions or real world transactions which have not migrated, have not transformed, they become somehow a little bit weird. Um, you know, you, you've all ordered food on Foodie, right? hugely, you know, hugely attractive, you know, with, with one thumb you can order whatever you want, whatever budget, you know. What's the worst part about Foodie? It's when the courier can't find your address and he starts speaking to you in some heavily accented, um, you know, English language and you're trying to explain to him, what do you see? Turn left, go forward, you know, take a right. This is the worst part precisely because it's the non-digital part. Right? The whole digital transaction up until then has been tremendously smooth and efficient and enriching and it's given you unlimited possibilities. Um, and yet the bottleneck becomes that last non-digital part. And I, I think we see this very, very often. So for example, um, if you've ever had to stand in line for something, today this is tremendously irritating. You know, because the, the task that you could, you could do in a fraction of a second or in a, you know, a fraction of a minute suddenly slows down because of other people's incompetence and because of a slow manual process. Um, explaining to the delivery guy, like I said before, trying to go to a travel agent and issue a ticket. How many of you have been, have ever had a travel agent experience? It's something which you guys have no knowledge of. Um, in, in, uh, in 2000, Cyprus had over 770, about 800 travel agents registered creating, I don't know, at least 5,000 places of employment. And my company had to do their, their strategy for the next 10 years. And we said, you know, the main risk is the risk of disintermediation. 
And it's ironic because travel is increasing. Travel is a larger section of GDP. More and more people want to travel. They want to travel more and more often. Low-cost airlines make travel or can make travel cheaper and cheaper and so on and so forth. But what's the threat? All of this will take place without the travel agent. Right? There's a, there's a total disintermediation because the manual process of trying to explain things like flights or hotels or whatever, it's now simply no longer fit for purpose at all. And my fear is that so much of our society is no longer fit for purpose. And I'm afraid that starts with our public schools um, and, and you know, the mode of education delivery, and it just extends into so many other parts uh, of our society. So if you are feeling a bit weird sometimes, it's not you. <laughs> it, it literally is the system that you're in. Yeah. What is fit for purpose? So fit for purpose means whether the system that exists can, can fulfill its mission in the same way as its original purpose. Um, if you take, for example, the, the way of learning languages in primary school, right? How do you learn languages? There's a teacher, there's a blackboard, there's a book of exercises, and you just do exercises over and over again. What would a more efficient system be? It would probably be some form of digital learning whereby you might be in an immersive environment and you might be learning the language a lot more quickly because you're associating the language with a virtual world where you're actually using the language. So for example, what's more efficient? Learning how to say Aristera, Vexia, Fia, or being in a virtual environment and pretending to guide a taxi driver, right, you know, to your house. If you were to guide the taxi driver, the language would suddenly be linked to you know, a real world scenario. Whereas if you're in the classroom, the problem is, is that the way we're learning is in a very theoretical scenario. So when we say fit for purpose, it means can we still get the value out of that original business process given the transformations that have taken place since then? And again, my, my, my fear is that right now we are, you know, we're, we're a long way behind the digital potential we have and we're a long way behind the digital adaptation curve that we see in a lot of other countries. So there's a clear social result, and it's not all positive, right? I mean, uh, a lot of this is favorable. We can handle more information, we can learn more things, we can do things at our individual pace, we don't have to work from the office, we can work from home, we don't have to learn from school, we can learn from wherever. But there's a lot of negative effects which also come out. What are some of these? Well, first of all, people no longer read information. They scan information. Before, we would literally be taught to read, right? We would have these huge books, and we would be given reading assignments, you know, whether in school or at university, which would be sometimes tens or, you know, 50 pages per course, per day, or per week, uh, or whatever. Um, I remember when I went to a university, every professor acted as if I were the only student in I, as, as if that was the only class I was taking. So I wasn't taking four classes, I was just taking one class. And so every, every professor was giving us like 200 pages, 300 pages of reading every week, and you literally had to read it. You, know, you didn't have any choice not to read it. Today we scan information, right? We're on the screen, we're scanning. We're not reading every word. We are probably reading the words that stand out, and sometimes, because of that, we don't process the information or we process the information in a different way. Let's put it that way. Very few people are capable of critical or analytical thought. It's something that we no longer teach necessarily in a lot of our schools or a lot of our universities. We, we don't have courses in logic anymore. Um, and because of that, people tend to believe what is written online without trying to evaluate the source or trying to evaluate the realism or the you know, the, 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 the validation of the source or the argument which is being made. And so, you know, a lot of very highly educated people which you, you know, you would normally think should be able to balance an argument, read different, you know, read different versions, try to reconcile different versions of the truth. They, they, they prefer to, to latch on to that version of the truth which is most attractive to them rather than, you know, the source of truth which you might arrive at through looking at cause and effect, looking at sources, looking at you know what we know as objective reality. And because of that, society's become very polarized. And you know, we don't have an answer to this. This problem has been very present on social media for the past 15 years. There have been initiative after initiative 
to try to change it. We're not able to change it. Um, and this is a problem. I mean, our, our, again, our, our democracies may not be fit for purpose if we don't have a population capable of informed decision, but we have a, a population which is making decisions based on um, you know, so, some other form of logic rather than the form of logic that we've kind of been building on since the Second World War. The more social media you use, the more depressed you're going to get. I know this may sound uh, like an exaggeration, but research after research has shown this. So again, if you are, you know, you guys, again, you're the digital natives. Um, I, I'm sure you're now used to things like bullying online. You're used to things. You know how to deal with adverse situations online. But younger generations don't. They have to go through this learning process. And it can be a very, very cruel and difficult learning process, which frankly, you know, if you think about your parents, your parents have never been trained to understand this or deal with it. You were, you know, the police have never been trained to understand uh, or deal with this. And I don't know how many of you saw this, uh, ma this movie in 1999, The Matrix. For me, it was like a, it was an amazing experience. Um, you know, what we feared at that time was that the world, the physical world was a construct, right? It was, we were all plugged in. Um, our brains were being used to harvest energy and to keep us docile, there was like this digital effect, a digital simulacrum, simulacrum playing nonstop. Um, well, I think what we feared in 1999 has totally taken, has totally been achieved today in 2023. It just has a different form. We're not plugged in. We're not physically immobile. We're not living in a pot of nutrient soup. But we are plugged into the screen and we are plugged into the internet. And if you look at the time you spend every day on the internet or, or on your phone, you know, I'm amazed because, you know, I'm getting readings like nine hours a day or something like that. Um, and why is that? Because so much of my communications now for business occur on the phone and with two thumbs. <laughs> Uh, so much of my reading, you know, of news or whatever, occurs on the phone. Um, if I'm going between, uh, like, you know, I, I, I came up from Limassol, I was on the phone the whole way, basically, responding to emails or, or messages. So, um, the reality is, is that we're kind of hooked on digital, and we're still trying to figure out where this is going to get us to. Now, about a hundred and some years ago, Karl Marx made this a statement that religion is the opiate of the masses. And what he was trying to say is that in order to keep control of masses of a population that have been industrialized, that live in cities, we need some way to occupy the aspirations of this group because the daily reality is not going to be so uh, positive for them. So his answer was religion is that solution. It is that opiate, that, that opium. Today I believe that same function is now fulfilled by whatever we do online. And I'm not saying this in a good or bad way. I'm simply saying that, you know, for so many people who may be, you know, working at minimum wage, may, may be, um, you know, working in adverse conditions, may be unemployed or whatever, um, you're, you know, a lot of people are going to go online to try to find some measure of comfort and some measure of salvation, as it were, because the physical and real world um, are no longer doing it for them. And, and, and I know this sounds a little bit weird, but think about prices, for example, right? If you want to live in central Nicosia, what's the price of the rent of a one-bedroom apartment? 500 euro, 600 euro. Price of a one-bedroom apartment in Paris is over 2,000 euro right now. The price in London is a little bit more. So if you've just left the university, and, or you've just left high school and you're working at minimum wage, you cannot afford to live by yourself um, in your capital city. And I, I know this is not news to any of you. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're struggling with this issue of prices every day. So, I mean, what's the solution? Where do you go? Well, I mean, a lot of us are going to go online to divert ourselves because we cannot afford to go shopping. We cannot afford to, um, you know, go to restaurants. We cannot afford to do all of these things that our society has kind of based itself on um, as means of diversion. So, you know, the human experience is now really, really, really going online. And, um, 
Back here we were talking about video games. Today it might be Netflix, right? Tomorrow it's probably going to be a virtual reality version of Netflix or something else. But clearly it's the digital world which is becoming almost more important than the physical world simply because we have a function not just of technology but also of income and income in the form of Yeah? But in this, uh, on this topic about uh, people living in harsh conditions, confidence of your mind, I'm not condemning it. I totally understand it. I, uh, I totally understand it. And, and I, am, I am someone who's able to go out <laughs> to a restaurant. But nine times out of ten, I'm, you know, after a heavy day of work, the only thing I want is Netflix. You know, or, or you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe reading something, like a, a novel, and I'm going to read it on my phone, probably. So I'm, I'm totally not condemning it. I, I'm just observing that the system is kind of emerging, it's becoming mainstream, and I think we are, you know, we're still coping with the aftermath, basically. Um, Cyprus is one of those countries which is kind of at the forefront of the fact that our city centers are being hollowed out. So if you go along Makariu, uh, or on a, on a parallel street of Makariu, or, or, or a lot of other main streets, how many empty storefronts will you see? Next time you go, count them. Just take a quiet look and count how many empty storefronts there are. And that's for two reasons. First of all, because the price of the rent has gone up to unsustainable levels. But second of all, because people are, are, are transacting online. They're not going out and you know, sitting in a stool um, in hot weather or you know, going, into, going into a small, uncomfortable store where the selection is limited. So we see this in a, in, in a range of different areas. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these. Uh, I, will, I will just take a few of these, but um, uh, you know, we, we can start, for example, with entertainment. And I firmly believe that, for instance, by 2030, if you happen to wake up from a long sleep and you do not know if you've got uh, you know, like a, a, a headset on, or if you do, you're not going to know the difference. In fact, if you have the headset on, what you're going to be seeing and experiencing is going to be a lot more enriching and rewarding than the real world, than, than the real physical world. Why? Because you'll be able to control it. You'll be able to control your surroundings, you'll be able to control what you're doing, how you react, um, and you know who you, re who you interact with, and everything else. And this is the world that we're literally going towards. You know, we're going to towards a world where we, we may well be connected online in a metaverse or in a multiplayer game or something like that. But the digital interactions we have will be far more satisfying than the interactions in, in, in the real physical world, at least for a majority of different transactions. And, you know, we one of the things that happens in the real world is this, this continual validation of self, right? So, I mean, in so many of these games, you have an avatar, right? You can choose the avatar. You can choose the skin of the avatar. You can choose weapons if you're using weapons. You can choose colors. You, can, you develop something which is essentially an expression of yourself, which can be so self-engrossing and so, so complete that it's very, very difficult to replicate in the real world. Again. Um, the cost of an avatar on some of these games might be might be high. It might be a thousand euro. But what's the cost of say, you know, a high spec BMW or high spec Mercedes? It's a hell of a lot more, right? And it's unobtainable for most of us. So the digital world is 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 fundamentally very very comforting and very very I would say seductive, and it's a it's a brilliant form of self validation. Today we are removed from the screen, right? Today we look at the screen from a proximity, from, you know, wh whether it's a, a flat screen, whether it's our, our, our tablet, whether it's our laptop, whether it's our phone. As we move into the future, we're going to be immersed in the screen. We're going to have this augmented or immersed reality because we're going to be wearing goggles, we're going to be wearing headsets, and we may even have haptic input, right? We may be wearing gloves or something where, you know, if you want to say, say you're car racing and you want to change the gear, you will do a, a, a movement in the air and you will receive a haptic input from your glove that yes, you're now in say fifth gear rather than fourth gear or something like that. 
Um, and, and this is already here. This technology is already here. If you, uh, how many of you have used a Quest or an Oculus from Facebook? Um, it is an amazing experience. The only downside is we don't even we don't have enough digital content yet to make it really 4K, really immersive. In, in my opinion, you know. So if, if you're if you're using if you're using a headset, you need a really high speed data line. But more importantly, you need the content which makes it worthwhile. And our problem today is really the content. But we're getting there. You know, the, the content is getting better and better and better. And again, when Apple launches its headset, probably in January, maybe March, with the typical delays, we're going to be getting a qualitative level of difference. So, like, whatever you're feeling on a, on a Quest 2 or a Quest 3, it's literally going to be 10 times better. Yep. Uh, you keep saying we will wear this, we will be immersive. Do you think at some point it will become mandatory? Yeah. I think so. I think so. Just as today we say you need to have a good knowledge of Microsoft Word or you need to have a, new, a good knowledge of Python or whatever, I believe in the future there's going to be a lot of uh, professions where you're literally going to plug yourself into a virtual uh, reality environment for like seven or eight or ten hours a day. And, and that's where you're going to be working, creating, solving problems. Isn't that the point where that the world kind of burn? Is that become uh, compulsory to be in another? Um, how many of you have worked in a cubicle? Anyone? Have, has anyone worked like at, a, at a, say, a telephone, a telephone center or any kind of big companies where they have these cubicles? Um, so working in a cubicle is very interesting because on the one, from the outside it looks very, very dehumanizing. You're like, I don't want to be like a rat in a cage my whole life. But on the other hand, within the confines of your cubicle, you're the master, depending on company policy, right? You can decorate your cubicle as you want. You put everything within reach. You've got your screen or your screens or whatever. Um, and so people are able even to adapt to a non-digital physical um, space whereby the only um, connection is you know, their screen or, or maybe a phone. So I think that I think people will be able to adapt to a lot. But I'm going to go one step further. Again, this, this new reality that we're creating is so attractive. I think people are going to prefer to be online, at least those people who still have jobs. Um, let, let, you know, that's another dimension that, that we'll talk about. Um, and this is already here. We have this technology already. The technology is being applied in certain uh, B2B sectors. It's being like. Uh, some industrial production lines, automotive repair, um, teaching people how to manage like huge cruise ships or how to, you know, how to repair the engines on huge cruise ships and stuff like that. Um, you've probably all seen virtual games, which have, you know, this type of, um, this type of interaction. Uh, it's simply going to continue um, until again, it, it is it is a standard part of our lives. So like imagine, so for me, like what, one of my priorities would be to invest in a startup whereby you know how today you go to like let's say, let's say you want to go to Paris, right? So you go to Google, you search Paris, maybe you search hotels, maybe you search tourist attractions, whatever Eiffel Tower, and what do you get? You get a two-dimensional view of the Eiffel Tower, or you get a two-dimensional view of the hotel, and maybe there's like a 3D virtual reality, which is you know a little, a bit crappy basically, given what we can do today. Well, in the future, you're going to be there through your VR. You're going to be walking through the hotel room. You'll be walking through the whole hotel, and there'll be little prompts which will be opening up, which you can choose to interact with or not. So, like, imagine the hotel buffet, right? Um, you will see the buffet, and if you want, you can see the dietary information. If you want, you can, you know, see the recipe. If you want, you can talk with a cook or something. But the way we react to sales and marketing is going to fundamentally change. Tourism is the world's largest industry by GDP. It has practically not made a big technological step in the past 20 years apart from putting a database online. That's pretty much all it's managed to do. Think about the technology we have today. So much technology which hasn't been applied to 20% of the world's GDP. We're talking about a huge opportunity to make money with you know, a really simple technology. Um, take property. Right? Also, a huge, um, huge segment of the world's economy. Go onto a property website, what do you see? You see two-dimensional photos, you see floor plans, 
Again, maybe this crappy 3D thing, which really doesn't help. Well, right now we've got the tools to do a full walkthrough. You could even sit down on an armchair, right? And, and the perspective will change based on your armchair. Or you could, you could fast forward and you could see what the sunset looks like versus what the sunrise looks like at different times of year. All of this is possible. And to be, to, you know, what's ironic, the challenge isn't the technology, the challenge is getting the film crews and the film editors capable of processing the footage to put into an, an augmented or immersive reality um, framework. So guys, if you want to make a, you know, one of the amazing careers that you can do is learn how to take and edit high resolution video footage because you will be in huge demand. Right? There's not a lot of people who can understand how to, how to interpret a sales situation through 4K video and be able to edit it and again put it into one of these frameworks. That's one of the, one of the crucial um, professions today. And if you're good at that profession, your work is going to be admired all over the world. So you can work all over the world. But again, very few people <laughs> will actually, you know, right, right, you, Who's going to teach you that? <laughs> Who has even mentioned that in any of the career fairs or anything else you've gone to? And yet the technology is there, the demand is there. Right? Um, this is an addictive area. I'm not, I, I don't want to get into that. You, you can have the uh, slides here um, distributed, but more and more evidence shows that the more we gamify, the more we have the dangers of addiction. So a, a dangers to overuse. And that applies to video games or computer games, um, it applies to social media, um, and governments have actually made attempts to regulate this. They've, they've made attempts to regulate, for example, uh, you know, how long people can actually spend on, say, Facebook, and, and what hours um, kids can spend on Facebook, and all of these have basically failed. So apart from a society like China, which can literally control the levers of the internet and has a single decision-making system, I don't believe that in the West we'll be able to regulate this. So I, I do believe that the problem of addiction is going to be a problem that we're going to have to face somehow. But you know, just like we've failed the war on drugs, for sure we're going to fall we're going to fail this you know war on, on digital addiction. And because of that, I also think education is going to fail. You know? What happens when you guys are digitally more competent than your teachers. I mean, you know, w one of the basic issues of a teacher is the authority, the expertise with which they speak, and the kindness, and you know, everything else. Um, but fundamentally, it's authority. And again, when we're dealing with digital natives like you guys, I know there are people in this room who can do things digitally much, much better than I can. Um, and the question is, you know, <laughs> how do you teach? How, how do you impart knowledge when knowledge has become so specialized, but also so well rewarded? And you know, in a well rewarded sector, why would anyone take a step down to to teach? Sorry, I'm <laughs> this is this is this is a big problem we have. You know, I mean, how 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 do you compensate teachers and how do you get real experts into the classroom? This is a problem we all face. It's it's a fit for purpose problem. Uh, that again, it's it's very very difficult to solve. Sorry. Yeah, please. Is the gamification of uh, education and in general the gamification of things an objectively bad thing? In your opinion. It's it's hard to say without actually looking at what extent it's going to go, what what the planned outcomes were, you know, what the level of gamification is. Um, it's interesting also that ch um, youth respond to gamification in one way, adults respond in a very different way. So adults who have gone through um, you know, the classic education system, so adults my age or, or Anos's age, you know, if, if we want to learn a language, there's a lot of evidence that shows gamification in language learning can be successful because you're trying to, you know, you're creating some biochemical like shortcuts and incentives. Which, which people can respond to. But again, we have our basis in the pre-digital, uh, you know, the fundamental learning structure, so I think we can handle it. Um, what happens with digital natives, I, I don't know. 
and, and literally it, it, it depends on how far you're going to go, what the rewards are, and so on and so forth. But um, I do know for a fact that we cannot gamify everything. You know, and uh, in, in the States we have this tendency now that everyone gets a prize, no matter if they're first place or second place or third place. What's important is the participation, and, and I agree with that. But then the question is, if we're, if we're just awarding participation, how will we really award excellence? And then where's, where's the boundary between gamification for the sake of a substitute or an incentive for learning versus gamification at the center um, of learning? So it's, it's, it's a really huge subject. Second point is labor. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of at the high point of my, my career. I'm 52 years old. I've been doing the same thing for 30 years now. Um, the work that I do now, I estimate that 50 to 60 percent of it will be eliminated by AI within the next 10 years. Same thing applies to lawyers. Same thing applies to accountants. Same thing applies to software engineers. Um, architects, um, the teaching profession, a lot of what we do now is rooted in, you know, a method of working which was, was viable in the last, say, 50 years, but going forward, there's like a big, big barrier, and, and, and there's, there's a imeromenia lixis, there's a, there's a shelf life for how we work. And I think for those of you who've seen any kind of uh, like AI application in the last 12 months or 18 months, I think you see it really, really clearly. You might have experimented with ChatGPT, for example, and used it to help you write ex essays. Today I was on Excel, and I don't know, sometime, sometime overnight, last night, or, or last couple nights, Excel updated. And AI is now in Excel, so I was replicating some tables. Um, and the tables were replicating themselves. They were populating themselves. I'm like, yes, finally. Excel became intelligent. <laughs> Excel can predict what I want. Um, so, I mean, these are great, you know, th these are great tools for instruction right now, or they're tools for helping us complete our work. But literally, we're going to be replaced, or the work we do is going to be replaced moving into the future. How many of you have studied accounting, or how many of you have, have a parent who's an accountant? Or, okay. I would estimate that roughly 90% of the job of an accountant is one thing, it's expenditure management, right? And, and one of the core tasks every month is you've got, to, you know, you've got to print out the corporate account and you have to reconcile all of the expenditure and income from the corporate account with the actual physical invoices and the actual reason of that expenditure. So for example, if I fly to Athens for a trade fair, I will have a ticket, I will have some taxi receipts, I will have a hotel bill, I will have some maybe restaurant meals, whatever. And you know, what, what do you have to do at the end of the week or the end of the month? You have to print these out, you have to go and you have to say, okay, this was for that trade fair, or this expense was for that, that customer, or that project, or something else. This is expenditure reconciliation and expenditure monitoring, basically. And if you look at the work of the, an accountant today, roughly 90% of the work is in this area. Well, all of this can be already replaced by AI and by automated systems. It cannot be done in Cyprus because our banks have not yet opened up banking software to third-party applications, but it's already happening in, in countries like the U.S., where if you take an application like Intuit Quicken or Zoho Books or whatever, you can link that to your bank account, and it will automatically, as soon as an expenditure comes into your bank account, it will automatically be brought into Zoho or into Quicken. And it will say, you know, Aegean Airlines, this is airfare because it recognizes what Aegean was from previous things. This is the amount, this is the VAT, this is the total. Now imagine that. On the one hand, it's incredible because 90% of the, the drudge work you're doing is no longer needed. On the other hand, it's a little bit frightening. Because if you have an office, say, with 10 accountants, and eight of them are doing this, you know, what are you going to do with them? <laughs> who, who, you know, what, 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 will they, what will they do, or what will you, as the boss of the company, do to maintain their payroll? And then just as travel agents were disintermediated, because someone can now go online and book travel directly much better, the same thing will happen with accounting. More and more small enterprises will simply do the accounting by themselves, and again, this is really interesting. How many of you have like, ever been to Portugal or Spain? I was amazed because I, I invested in a startup uh, during COVID. And 
the country that we chose to launch in was Portugal. And I was astounded because when we went to set everything up, our, our, our accountant there informed us that we could only use like one of 10 different accounting packages. And the accounting package was live with the Ministry of Finance. So every time we sold something, the, um, the, the invoice or the receipt, you know, it went into our system, but it was automatically recorded at the Ministry of Finance. So you can't screw around on the one hand, right? You've got to be extremely careful in what you're doing. But on the other hand, think of the level of automation that this means. This means that all of our expenditure, on the one hand, we don't have to worry about it because it'll be taken care of electronically, but it also means that we're in an environment which is incredibly transparent, right? You cannot easily hide your income or avoid income uh, depending on what sector you're in. Uh, Russia has had such a system for, for over seven years now. Greece is now thinking about implementing such a system. Um, so technology is already changing things, and it's changing things so rapidly that um, right now we're looking at software replacement, and by 2040, I believe we're going to be looking at full robotic replacement. Um, you know, it, Right now, you walk into a McDonald's, right? You wait to get served, you put your order in the touch screen, and it's largely humans who do the work. Um, McDonald's has already experimented with robots. They already have, you know, they're already on track to developing a, like a robotically equipped restaurant, which will be more efficient than a human-run restaurant. Some things will go bad. I mean, some things are, are problematic. There's, uh, there's like some catastrophic scenarios which can emerge from that. But in general, the level of people that are needed by a restaurant can be cut down by 75 to 80 percent. Um, think about that. Uh, taxi drivers, bus drivers. In Tokyo, at the Tokyo Olympics, all of the transfers between the athletes' village and the athletic facilities were done by driverless buses provided by Toyota. Today in San Francisco, they're already, they already have driverless taxis. And San Francisco is a difficult city to drive in. There's lots of hills, there's lots of homeless, there's lots of obstacles. Um, so in the next, you know, to 2030, we're looking at a software replacement. But by 2040, we're looking at a hardware replacement. Okay? Um, I, I, I haven't been uh, recently, but in, I, I've, I've just seen some very interesting COVID innovations which were done in China. The room service at a lot of Chinese hotels now is now delivered by robot. So there's literally a little robotic cart. The kitchen will put the room service in the cart, and the cart knows what floor to get to, what door to come to. And as soon as it gets outside the door, there's an automatic thing triggered. You go to the door, you open it up, you see this little cart in front of you, you lift the lid, you take out your food, and that's it. There's no human interaction needed. Um, so again, we're, we're, we're really, really, really coming along here fast. And you might have heard of the term cobots, like co-working robots. So on a production line today, if you're in, say, automotive production, cobots are doing a lot of the work for you. They're doing a lot of the lifting. They're doing a lot of the, you know, arc welding uh, or spot welding. They're doing a lot of the, you know, the heavy bolts and stuff like that. And we call them cobots to show that they are working alongside humans. Um, but eventually, <laughs> believe me, they're, they're simply going to replace humans. Um, you've probably all seen this amazing Roomba. And now Xiaomi has just come out with like a, a version which is like one fourth of the cost. But this is simple, right? We have, if you ever have a chance, go to Boston Dynamics, Do You Love Me? And, and see how this robot and some other robots are dancing. The level of like physical control they have is, is something incredible. Um, in COVID, uh, during, say in Japan during COVID, they could not have the audience in the stands, but they still allowed the, the baseball teams to play. Baseball is a national obsession in Japan. And to make sure there was enough noise, they put robots in the stands. And the robots were like dancing and waving flags according to different songs and, and things like this. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of scary. Uh, this is the, uh, the McDonald's um, example I talked about. We have robot deliveries now, which are very, very common. Um, and again, I believe that depending on the city you're in and depending on what you're getting delivered, this is going to be standard, right? There's, there's no more 
trying to explain to the nice man from Sri Lanka where he has to turn and what floor he has to get to. It's simply going to come either by drone or by, by driverless vehicle. We have robotic weapons, of course, um, ranging from drones, like the, the Reaper drone or the, the Turkish drone, um, I forget the name of it, but there's now ground-driven tanks, there are now uh, you know, surface drones like this one here, there's underwater drones. Um, the F-35 is now experimenting flying with one or two drone wingmen, so fully automated uh, aircraft which will act as air-to-air -air, you know, defense suppression or air-to-ground suppression and things like that. So the number of pilots we have will become less and less, and more and more pilots will be sitting in a chair you know, in, a, in an office somewhere, and they will be piloting you know, either the tanks or the, 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 the planes or anything else that we're going to war with. So, um, again, by 2030, by 2035, we're going to have robots at the lower level of our economic activities. So we're going to have robots saying, um, maybe watering grapes, maybe picking olives, maybe not in Cyprus, but in a lot of other countries. We, you know, that's called precision agriculture. I believe 90% of the lower value work of accountants, lawyers, consultants will have been replaced. 50% of lower value work in careers like nursing, elderly care, transport, and military will have been replaced. And we know this is taking place. We know the investment plans um, that are, you know, that are in effect. And by 2040, we're, we're looking at, you know, far more advanced functions. By 2040, if we go to war with Turkey, it's a war which is going to be fought by drones. So the deciding factor is going to be industrial. It's your industrial capacity, right? It's not going to necessarily be the human capacity. Um, and I, I think if you look at the Azerbaijan-Armenia war two years ago, I think we saw that really clearly. If you look at the U Ukraine war right now, we see it really, really clearly. But we're talking about you know, an industrial revolution in, in, in warfare, which is literally changing everything. And you know, until now, what has been the main barrier of warfare? It's been the fear of casualties, right? It's been the fear of bad headlines and the fear of, you know, people coming home in body bags and, and the domestic resistance that this creates. Well, what happens when wars are fought by robots? Robots don't have parents, right? Robots don't have, uh, you know, if, if they take a casualty, sometimes they can be repaired or they can be scrapped. But there is no barrier anymore to the idea of war if war is fought in an antiseptic way, machine towards machine, basically. Health, same thing here. Um, you look at so many things which are happening in the health field. We are literally going from, you know, being humans to being cyborgs. I mean, we're, we're, we're literally moving in that direction. Um, one of, the, one of the targets which I believe is going to be very achievable, at least by 2050, and we're very, very close right now, but we're very close to engineering the human lifespan to hit at least 130 years and probably 150 years. I predict that within 10 to 15 years, you guys will be able to take a pill every day, which will increase your longevity probably to 150, assuming you don't have any genetic damage or you know things like that, which, which might affect it. Mm -hmm. Which very good retirement at 110? Very good question. Um, it's not just retirement, it's the question of class, right? Because who's going to benefit from this the most? Presumably it's going to be the rich until the technology has been mainstreamed, if it ever becomes mainstream. And uh, how many of you have seen Altered Carbon on, on Netflix? If you see one science fiction series, Altered Carbon, especially the first season, um, it's all about the idea that we have managed to prolong the human lifespan significantly longer so what happens when, you know, what happens like when Elon Musk, right, who was at one point the richest man in the world, what happens if someone like that prolongs his lifespan and then prolongs the lifespan of his wife and his children um, and then the children of the children? children. I mean, we're, we're, not, we're not really in a democracy anymore. <laughs> we're going to be in a real plutocracy, um, which is not just, you know, life is not just going to be a function of what you can buy. It'll be a function of how long you can live and how many years of life you have in front of you. We'll be able to self-select positive genetic traits while curing genetic diseases. We're very clearly along this path right now, and there's any number of trials taking place uh, here. And of course, this has already been done with non-human 
things, right? We have we've, ge we've genetically engineered our agriculture, right? We've genetically engineered household pets. We've genetically engineered uh, tulips. We have no qualms about that. Um, and we're right now working on the human genome. And why? Because we can suddenly model the human genome very, very um, cheaply because of technology. Um, but beyond, beyond the genetic interventions, you know, what we now need to say, go to the doctor for to get a pill or to get a shot or whatever, all of that stuff is simply going to be wearables and implants with the medication delivered, you know, using a mix of remote sensing and then using a mix of pre-programmed protocols. It's all going to be automated. If you have diabetes, you will no longer need to worry about getting a shot. You, you will no longer need to worry about, you know, checking your insulin levels. It's all going to be done automatically, literally. And, and that'll be great, you know, I think for, for a lot of people. These are some examples of what's taking place now. So uh, the COVID vaccines were vaccines using the messenger RNA. And there is, there are literally, I'm not exaggerating, but there's probably trillions of research dollars right now going into how we can use mRNA. One of the most promising areas here is a cancer vaccine for reducing melanoma. We have uh, advanced uh, trials for pancreatic uh, cancer. This is a Chinese scientist who created the first gene genetically edited baby. That was something which is totally forbidden. Uh, international law, or at least the law that most countries have signed up for, prevents genetic editing of the human gene code. This guy went ahead and did it. Okay, so we're using genetic therapy now, and again, this is really, really positive. But it's it's only a question of time before we start looking at 100% genetically personalized therapies, right? So a therapy just for you, <laughs> and part of that is going to be before you're born, and part of that may be while you're alive using the messenger RNA molecule. So there is, yeah, I mean, th this is a whole new frontier, and we talk about changing the biology of the human race, this is essentially what we're doing. And believe me, I, I, I know it sounds weird, but we have the capabilities now because of CRISPR. CRISPR is a method of understanding and then editing the genes in the human body. 10 years ago, this thing might have cost millions and millions of research dollars, Today, it can be done literally on a tabletop application, literally, okay? From wearables, we're definitely going to go into implants. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the BrainGate program, but it's one of the most promising. It's one of the leading startups in essentially bypassing any kind of physical interface with the brain and going directly into a neuron interface. So direct interface with the deepest thought processes, biological controls, things like that. And this is great. If you have like Alzheimer's, there's a chance you could get your mental recovery back. If you're a cripple, if you have like a spinal cord injury, there's a chance you can control your leg because we can bypass the damaged part of the spinal cord and the nerves there, and we can go directly to the nerves that control the legs or the knees or the hips or, or anything else. Uh, Elon Musk, Neuralink. I don't know if any of you have, have seen this, but you know, if you want to keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on, check out Neuralink, sign up for its mailing list. Uh, these are the guys who have done uh, direct interface circuit boards with the brain of a pig, so they can actually control how a pig walks, how it gets up, how it sits down, the movement it makes, and so on and so forth. Why would they use pigs? For the same reason medical schools do. Right? If you go to if you go to, to, to if you're in the army and you try to qualify as a medic, they're going to give you a pig and they're going to tell you keep this pig alive for as long as you can, and then they're going to shoot it, they're going to bayonet it, they're going to do all kinds of nasty things to it, because that pig's DNA and its organs are very similar to human DNA and organs. And so, if you know that Musk is experimenting with pigs, I would say that you know. This is not anymore in the realm of the improbable. This is now in the realm of simply waiting for getting the product to the market, essentially. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And it's, again, it's stuff which begins at the, at the basic level, 
and it goes all the way through to the most advanced level, but it's moving in one direction. And so I've called this speech Digital Utopia, Digital Dystopia, because like everything else we do, there's good and bad. So if you think about our, our, our technical future, right? And if you're in a good mood, and if you're, you know, if you are uh, feeling optimistic, probably you're going to think of something like Star Wars. Uh, sorry, Star Trek, not Star Wars. Star Trek, when it came out in the 60s or whatever, it presented a very optimistic mood of human progress through technology. It had like solutions for how multi-ethnic societies could blend together, how you know things like econ like a global economy could be engineered, and so on and so forth. How we could expand through space and deal with you know hostile uh, or or at least unknown uh, um, races and, and, and biologies. So if you're in the utopia frame of mind, it's the Star Trek future. Why? Why is it utopia? Because we can cure if we want to so many of these horrible conditions that have plagued humanity for all of our history. We can expand the human lifespan. We could make everyone healthier. We could feed the whole world. There's no, today there is no technological barrier to human hunger. The only barrier is the barrier of will and maybe capital, basically. Um, we'll have the most advanced technology which will be evolving every year. We'll have robots to take care of us. We'll have software to take care of us. Right? We could probably terraform the earth, turn it into literally a Garden of Eden, if we wanted to. Um, you know, the question really is, do we want to, and will we? Sadly, so much of human history shows us that even when we get the technology, we don't necessarily use it for a common good, but we use it for the good of smaller interest groups. Uh, we use it to maintain power, we use it to you know, do things which are pretty damn cruel, you know, when you come down to it. And this is probably the Blade Runner future. You've probably all seen Blade Runner. Maybe not the original one, but probably the, the most recent one, where again we're looking at a post, uh, I mean a very dystopian future, a future where the ice caps have definitely melted, where climate changes take place, where we're harvesting slugs as a form of protein, where we have a homelessness problem, we have, you know, environmental problems, and so on and so forth. And the dystopia, or the reasons why this technological progress might result in dystopia, I think are clear. Because number one, human progress is never uniform. It's never even. We always have some countries who are early adapters. And then more importantly, we always have some sources of capital that create the technology and then want to return on the technology. So gains are concentrated at the top. And, and I think we see that really clearly. You know, whether you look at companies like Google, Amazon, um, uh, Meta, you know, um, and so on and so forth, we're really looking at a global elite which is more powerful individually than most governments are collectively. So let's take Elon Musk, right? Neuralink. Let's assume that the government of Cyprus was, was you know, and our archbishop was totally opposed to the idea of neural interface and all of that. Could Cyprus stop Elon Musk? Not a chance in hell, basically. <laughs> uh, could the United States government stop Elon Musk? Probably not. He would simply relocate. Okay? So, why the problem? Because first of all, technological gains aren't even. Second of all, because in the short term, we're looking at huge dislocations in labor. And unless we solve this problem, we're going towards mass polarization and probably huge military civil conflicts in, in the near future. And that will be a result of high inequality. It's going to be a result of the fact that young people, including your generation, will not see that they have much of a stake in society and you know all of the problems that we see today already. Uh, our population has hit 8 billion right now. We cannot feed roughly 1.5 billion, but even within countries like Cyprus, if you look at Eurostat data, roughly 25% of the Cypriot population is at risk of what the EU calls social exclusion or poverty. 25% is one out of every four people, right? I mean, it's not a small number. <laughs> so in Limassol, yeah, we have these bright shiny towers, we have Bugatti Veyrons on the streets and all of that, but we also have people who are literally picking through garbage, we have people who are homeless, and we have people who we prefer to ignore rather than trying to solve their problem collectively. 
So governments right now are really unable to mediate between growth and progress and the society on the other hand. And, and I hope I'm not saying anything you know, controversial here. Our governments, ranging from some of the most advanced, like you know, the US government, the Canadian government, or the Swedish government, or the French government, we all have problems. All of these entities have problems managing you know, this collective entity that we call the nation state today. Um, and, and that's why we see things like crime, that's why we see things like religious extremism, that's why we see hunger, and all of these other phenomena that we see. It means that the rich will definitely grow richer, but then through editing the genome, through editing our DNA, their DNA, I mean, we're changing what it means to be human. And I, I, I think this is almost inevitable. You may have heard geologically that we're in the Anthropocene era. So we were in the Holocene era before, roughly, um, since the Industrial Revolution, we're in a period of time when it's human activity which is changing the Earth the most rapidly. And that's CO2 emissions, ocean acidification, everything else which is taking place. Well, I see the same thing happening genetically, right? That Anthropocene era will be transferred. I mean, it, it, it will still continue with climate change, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a DNA Anthropocene era. And like everything else, it's going to be, you know, who has the money to do this? They will, they will have the latitude to seek these solutions and to seek these therapies and advantages. Hopefully that, you know, hopefully these techniques will become mainstreamed, but chances are there's going to be a heavy income component to some of these therapies. And because of this, there's a huge number of questions with what we see today. You know, we talked earlier about like the minimum wage is the minimum wage a livable wage? No, it's not, nearly nowhere in the world. Um, are we meeting the challenges of education? No. Can we combat extremism or, or even just free speech through censorship? Probably not. I, you know, I, I, I don't see that this is working. What, what happens when we spend more and more money on formal education and the formal education system, but our educational outcomes decline every year and our ability to manage or to interact with this new technological universe seems to be more and more distant every year. Um, what happens when wars are waged by drones? You know, there's, there's, there, there, there's huge questions that we need to ask ourselves. And I don't have an answer to these, right? I have only um, trends that I'm monitoring. I have fears that I have. I have uh, learning that I do when I go to different trade fairs, or I, I, I go to different like laboratory tours or factory tours, or I read the press and I read what's going on. Um, but again, the rate of change is accelerating massively, and it seems to me that as societies, we are less and less capable of actually managing it in some kind of a sustainable way. Um, and so on the one hand, we have the prospect of a glorious future, and some of you here may become the next Bill Gates or the next Elon Musk, um, and some of us may not. Some of us may be consigned to, you know, those people who have to stay home and live on basic income because they cannot adjust to uh, this new reality. So we've got opportunities, we've got threats. I think it's the, the, the necessity, the responsibility of any citizen, any student, right, any member of society. You, you have to keep up with this stuff. You have to become informed. You have to think in terms of yourself. How can I adapt professionally? How can I adapt you know, individually or as a member of a family? Because 2030 is not that far away. It's seven years away. Um, you, know, you blink and it will be here <laughs> upon us. Um, so that's, that's this thesis that we're monitoring. I'm, I'm hoping to publish some more research on it. Um, be glad to take any questions or any discussions. And if you want to, uh, if you want to contact me, you can do so either on LinkedIn or through my, uh, through my corporate, uh, through Navigator Consultants, basically. Questions? Comments or yours? <laughs> yeah, please. I said revolution, <laughs> I meant technical or like, you know, product revolution. So um, imagine the technology which was so 
amazing at the individual level that it could help you have like a cocaine high without the cocaine. Right? Because that's when you talk about neuralink and you talk about the brain neuron interface, part of it goes in that direction. Um, you know, would this be legal or illegal? We don't know. But there's almost definitely going to be a market for it. Right? And so someone like Elon Musk or somebody, it doesn't have to be Elon Musk, it can be anyone, right? But someone can commercialize the result of this technology, and it's highly unlikely that any government would be able to successfully stop them. And I say that not based on just empty statements, but if we cannot stop, if we're trying to imprison people for marijuana use, and we cannot, we cannot eradicate marijuana, how are we going to eradicate something which is much more powerful? Right? Probably we're not going to be able to. Um, yeah. But in your careers, I really encourage you keep up with technology. Even if you're not, you, you don't have to be a coder. You don't have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to be on the technical side. There are so many applications of technology which are not yet being done, and which have these huge opportunities. Um, uh, AI may replace coding at one point. It'll be it'll be too late for the innovation cycle, right? By the time that happens, it, you know. It will be too late for you as an innovator, probably. Um, but just when you see what's out there, um, it's it's incredible. And and again, if you're in Cyprus, and you see some of the innovations that are already in effect in countries like, say, the United States, there's already a huge marketplace simply bringing that technology here if you want to stay here or you know to other markets. So it really is you know this idea that we have this potential for a utopia. We have a lot of opportunities. And of course, there's a potential for the dystopia, which is, you know, all of the negative feedback and the negative uh, issues which may come about from this. But be optimistic. <laughs> um, I, I think we're living in the most exciting time of human uh, progression and human evolution. And believe me, if, if you, 2030 may seem like a long way away. It's not. 2030 is the day after tomorrow. 2040 is like in a week or a month. Um, once this technology is implemented, it's it's just a one-way street. There will be no going back. Remember when, like, there were all of these uh, suddenly there were all of these anti-plagiarism softwares that universities use, and then the first thing the technology did is they found alternatives, <laughs> right, to bypass the plagiarism system. I mean, it's 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 like that. There's you know. We will have technological change. Part of us, part of the system, will try to regulate it or try to make sure it's working properly. But then, you know, it's like a fast-flowing stream. It's just going to keep going. It's going to keep developing. Um, and and we just need to be aware of, of really what's going on. And don't rely on. Do not believe that the way we've been organizing our society since independence is going to allow us to organize our society even just 20 years in the future. That's not going to happen. Today we can get away with things like, like if you want to register a company in Cyprus, you have to go through a lawyer, right? Why? That creates secure employment for lawyers, basically. The risk of, of killing their talent at something where they might be in the top, like, X percentile of the world, and that could, like, really defend your own territory, just to go for a mass indoctrination, um, which was based on, like, a, a very basic industrial process. There's no reason for it. Chances are we're going to make the same mistakes, though. <laughs>